everybody. Welcome to Bex Reformed Church. All of our members, uh, if you have any of our guests that we have with us today, we hope you'll come back and join us again some other Sunday or Wednesday night or any other time that you, uh, that you can make it. Uh, and also the, the folks join us online. Uh, so glad you're worshiping with us this morning. Uh, a couple of announcements. Um, the, uh, the barbecue, uh, the Boston Bucks, uh, I think we see a member of the men's class. Uh, anybody in particular on that? So see Rick or call the church office, um, see Rick after, after church today if you would like to have that. Um, uh, so uh, it's hard to believe it's been a year since then and uh, we had that big catastrophe <laughs> last year. But things have been rebuilt, uh, so uh, it's going to be great. Um, also again this week, um, uh, ne actually next Sunday, our church uh, choir is going to have their cantata. Uh, so we'd love for you to join us with that as well. Um, some other things going on, we have Splash Kids today. Uh, luminaries are being set up. Uh, we have the college age party tonight as well. Uh, so we have a lot of things going on. Also on the 24th, please plan on uh, Christmas Eve. Please plan on joining us for the, uh, for the service at 11 o'clock that night. And also again the next morning because Christmas falls on Sunday this year uh, at 1030 Christmas morning. Love to see you all here. Any other announcements that we have? The Angel tree gifts, I think, are due today, looks like. And then also the Sunrise Citizens Christmas Party is coming up Thursday as well. Any other announcements? We have a lot, a lot of really special things going on this morning. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and invite the children up. They're going to light the candle and also sing us a few songs this morning. And then also Brooke Porter and David Franklin are going to sing the anthem today. Sunday of Advent. We light the third candle, which is called the Shepherd Candle, the candle of joy, reminding us of the joyous announcement to the shepherds in the field of the birth of Jesus. Hear the story as seen in the Gospel of Luke 2, 8, 20. And in the, that region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And in an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which will be to all the people for you too is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory, Glory to, to the God, God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they saw it, it 
it they made known which saying they had been told them concerning this child, and all who had heard it wondered at what shepherds told them. But Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. As it has been told them, the coming of Jesus meant that the promises and prophecy in Isaiah had been brought to fulfillment. We pray that during this third week of Advent, may we be simple shepherds who with joy praise God for the gift of Jesus. Let us pray. We joyfully praise you, O Lord, for for the fulfillment of your promise of a Savior and what means in our life. Thank you for the gift of salvation through your Son, Jesus. Create our hearts anew as you fill our lives with your living spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.
Pastor Paul, you're going to have a hard uh, hold a row after that. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. As we are uh, gathered here in worship, excuse me for a second. We're gathered here in worship. Uh, it's good to, uh, to see that in God's economy, uh, the first institution he instilled upon humanity was family. And it's nice to see the children in worship and learning those lessons that are so important for all of us to carry on from generation to generation. So let us celebrate that. As we prepare ourselves for prayer today, there's a, a lot of things in our, in our hearts and in this world that unfortunately uh, too often turns from the ways and the will of God. So somewhere in your prayer time, I hope that you not only pray for those that you know are in need of God's assistance and direction and courage and hope, but also pray that we as uh, individual members in the church are indeed seeking God's way and will. Before I do uh, say uh, or open up our prayer, uh, Margaret, it is wonderful to see you. Nice to see you. Let's go quietly into some prayer time individually, and then we will uh, join together in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we come in praise of you and in worship this day. For we are gathered here to uh, find your way and your will so that we can, uh, first of all, correct our way to be in your will and to be that which you wish us to be. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son that we celebrate in this season, but more importantly, we celebrate daily in our own hearts. And as we look into your world, we realize that it is indeed astray. But Father, you are aware of that since the beginning of time. That is why you sent your son. But as we uh, live, breathe, and work, we first of all come to thank you for life. And Father, we ask now those who we know that are in need of your guidance, strength, encouragement, may they Feel your loving arms wrap around them and know that there is indeed your love and your hope. Direct them, their family, and if need be, the doctors in which you're directing their care. And Father, throughout this world, there are uh, actions that indeed do not bring glory to you nor peace to the world. May those in positions, we pray for leadership, that they feel your strength but more importantly, they feel that they can come to you in repentance and be seeking your way and will. And Father, as we conclude this time of prayer, we join together in corporate prayer, saying that which you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We indeed have all been blessed. Sometimes we uh, only dwell upon the things that give us problems or complications, but when you look at the world in the sense we indeed are blessed because all of us are here because God created this world and everything that we have basically came from him. While we may be at work taking that which he has given us so that we may live and benefit, it all actually comes from him. And it is our opportunity at this time to give that which he has given to us to return to building his kingdom.
Father, as we return to you a portion of that which you have blessed and given to us, may it be used to build your kingdom in this church, in this community, and in your world. Amen. What a blessing this morning to have uh, Brooke uh, uh, play the piano and show her musical talent. Uh, so thank you. It's been a while. We've uh, uh, tried to uh, do a song together for the last couple years, um, but uh, lots of patience and uh, so happy to have her uh, uh, be part of the, the service this morning and, and uh, play this song. Um, so this song is very special for me. Uh, I've heard it about three years ago or so. Um, y you know, it helps me keep God, keep God in my heart and close to my heart. You know, it's about God's story, not my story. Here's Make Room. The family hiding from the storm found no place at the keeper's door it was for this a child was born to save a world so cold and hollow a sleeping town they did not know that lying in a manger low a savior king who had no home has come to heal our sorrow is there room in your heart is there room in your heart is there room in your heart for God to write his story Shepherds counting sheep at night Do not fear the glory light You are precious in his sight God has come to raise the lowly Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart for God to write his story? You can come as you are, but it may set you apart when you make room in your heart and trade your dreams for his glory. Make room in your heart, make room in your heart. Mother holds the promise tight, every wrong will be made right. The road is straight, the burdens lie. For in his hands he holds tomorrow. Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart for God to write his story? You can come as you are. But it may set you apart When you make room in your heart And trade your dreams for his glory Make room in your heart Make room in your heart 
Make room in your heart. Make room in your worship this morning. Now we come to worship in the Word. Uh, as David just sang, uh, save a little room at the end of the service as well in your heart at communion. As we worship through communion, and communion is a, a part of worship. Our Lord's Supper is a part of worship, and, and so uh, remember that it, it's a, it's a showing of the life and the death of Christ, and it's an expression of that. It's a sign of that. It's the preaching of that uh, in our worship service. I want to go with you for a moment to Second Corinthians. I don't want to read to you uh, our passage this morning. We're continuing this theme on comfort, and uh, we'll we'll probably I'm not going to say definitely we'll probably. Uh, lean toward Isaiah 53 on Christmas Eve. Um, Isaiah 53 was a, traditionally was in the history of, of the Christian church a, a text that was used to celebrate Christmas. And we'll talk about that a little bit, our suffering servant. And um, then on Christmas morning, we may, if we don't finish Isaiah 53 that night, by 2 a.m., if we're not done <laughs> on Christmas Eve, We'll, you know, we'll try that morning to take another stab at it, okay? That's what, I mean, that's what the guy said. They wanted it at 2 a.m., so we'll see if you guys, who's left at that hour. You guys in the balcony will fall asleep and fall out. I probably won't be able to raise you, though, like the Apostle Paul. Second Corinthians, Paul um, he begins to talk about comfort. And he has this description of God as this God of comfort. Listen to what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. That's what we're talking about this morning. The God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. He comforts us in all of ours, that we may be able to comfort those that are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in the comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Here's his final uh, word here. He says, our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our suffering, you will also share in our comfort. A lot of the use of the word comfort there in our text. But we're going to um, dig in a little deeper here for a minute. Jesus, we come before you this morning dependent upon you. In the, in the worship we've already had, we thank you, we praise you for it. That's all we have to offer is, is praise. We, you don't owe us anything. But you love us by your choice. 
and you didn't owe us any comfort, and you didn't owe us salvation, and you didn't owe us this moment, this church, you didn't owe us this building, you didn't owe us what we have, but you have blessed us with all we have, and so we, we pray we would be thankful. We ask that we'd have worshipful hearts. We pray, Lord, that, um, that we could see you more clearly as we preach, um, as we worship through your word. So we ask your blessing on this moment, in Jesus' name, and amen. It was uh, John Bunyan, you remember his book, Pilgrim's Progress, I've mentioned it a few times, but Bunyan, um, C.S. Lewis said that Bunyan wrote a book that has astonished the whole world. And Bunyan writes of how this character, his main character whose name is Christian, navigates through the Christian life and through many ups and downs, through struggles with the law uh, as far as the Old Testament, through struggles with his own heart and the burden. You, if you've read that story as a young person, it'd be a great story to read if you're up in age a little bit as well. But the burden that he carries, and how this burden falls off of him. Spurgeon said, um, he, he read it often. Uh, many people's li many lives have been changed. For a great deal of time, actually Bunyan's book, Pilgrim's Progress, the, only, the top two selling books in the world at the time were the King James Bible, this was more than 100 years ago, and Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. This book has had a mark on our culture, our past. What people don't know often about Bunyan, though, is he was thrown into prison for preaching the gospel in a way that wasn't sanctioned by the state, wasn't sanctioned by uh, England. And so he was placed in prison for not going by a book of order that the Church of England went by. Now, if you're from the Church of England or Episcopalian, I, I'm not telling the story to, to trigger you. That, everybody talks about being triggered lately. I wish everybody would calm down, won't, don't you? <laughs> really. Anyways, I won't get started on that. I almost did, but we won't. But um, the book of order that they used uh, in England, they had made it a requirement for you to use that book in the worship services. And Bunyan, he, I, I'm pretty sure he was a Baptist. Bunyan, um, he said, hey, listen, and many others that were uh, in the country, they said, hey, we want the freedom to worship the way that we believe we need to worship in our services. And a lot behind the reason this country our freedom of religion in this country was not uh, about, you know, the, the multiplicity of religions that were in our country. It was about the freedom as Christians to worship the way you want. If you were Presbyterian, you could worship as a Presbyterian. If you were a Baptist, you could worship as a Baptist, whatever you... And so there was that freedom that we had in the country. And so, well, Bunyan's thrown in the prison. You know, why didn't he just agree? I don't know. Maybe he had some convictions about him. So Bunyan's thrown into prison, but while he's in prison, while he's in prison, he had a daughter that was sick. And she was dying. And he couldn't see her. And he struggled day in and day out about seeing his daughter. And he suffered. And he said, of all the things he suffered, that was the hardest thing for him, is to suffer in that moment and not be able to see his little girl. But he wrote a book in his suffering, and he wrote a book that astonished the whole world. Now, I don't know what God has done with your suffering. But Bunyan illustrates for us, and Paul here in 2 Corinthians illustrates for us, that your suffering may run deep, but God can use your suffering. And he does use your suffering. 
Listen to what Paul says again. He says to us, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. And he goes on to talk about the things that he suffers. And he says, listen, but God has comforted me in the midst of what we have suffered. Many of our preachers are just playing, playing church, you know. Many of our Christi, Christians that we, we have in our country now are just so comfortable. Uh, we insulate ourselves so much from suffering. If you can do anything possible, insulate yourself so you don't have to suffer. But sometimes, sometimes you've got to understand, we're, we can't control what God brings into our life. We can't control and navigate the road that we're walking down. So regardless of outward pressures or inward pressures, sometimes God can find a way, he will find a way to bring glory out of your suffering. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Now, if you've been suffering, this message hits you and you do one or two things. Either you get bitter and you say, wait a minute, I'm not hearing this. And maybe you're in that place, and that's okay. Sometimes it's hard to look up. Sometimes it's hard to listen. Or you haven't faced any suffering in your life, and you think to yourself, you know, by the way, I know people that are in their 60s that have never really faced a lot of suffering. Do you know that? And that's tough on a, on a man and a woman. That's actually not a good thing. You know that? It's tough on you because here's what happens. You say, well, God's always been good. Things always worked out great. They always managed to work out in the end. You hear that philosophy? You know, you go to somebody's, well, think, what will be will be. Things will always work out in the end. Sometimes, I don't know if you're aware of this, Sometimes, FYI, things don't always work out the way you want it. Sometimes, listen ladies and gentlemen, sometimes you stand at the doorstep of somebody's house and it did not work out, okay? They had faith and it didn't work out and it destroyed their life and there's little pieces of their life strode all about their house and there's no, there's no room for just a cheerful word of, well, good luck, don't worry about it, it'll be okay. It's not going to be okay. Tell a rape victim it's going to be okay. Tell somebody who's dying on their deathbed and, and everything went sideways, it's going to be okay. I remember I had a neighbor one time. I'm preaching for you for a minute. Is that okay? We're preaching for Christ, but I'm preaching for you if you're broken in half this morning. I'm preaching on your behalf just for a minute, standing in the gap for you here for a minute. And then we're going to point to Christ, okay? Because you can't heal you and I can't heal you. But he can. I had a neighbor one time. One had cancer. And uh, one uh, was an adulterer. He just ran around on his wife all the time. Had a really good wife. You know, it wasn't one of these things where, well, she was probably a terrible wife. No, she was a great wife. You had one that was fighting for his life. So he could be with his family just one more day. He had another man living right beside the other one, just threw his whole life away. Didn't care. We live in a weird world. We live in a pain, we live, we live in a difficult place. Uh, the theological word is the word theodicy. Theodicy, what theodicy means is, is this how can God still be good in the midst of our suffering? And a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to figure out what, how to solve, untie that knot. But, but the place that that knot is untied is the cross itself. Because this good God who has committed no crimes and deserves zero punishment um, pays for the sins and is punished as if he was the worst criminal on our behalf and in his punishment in his stripes, in his beatings, in his difficulty. We are healed, my friends. And so there is great comfort in the cross of Christ. I want to just look at the Corinthians for a minute. Um, backing up for a minute, in 2 Corinthians 7, whenever Paul's writing to the Corinthians, he says, uh, in, in chapter 7, he says, uh, in verse 8, he says, for even if I made you grieve with my letter, 
I do not regret it. Just hang in here with me for a minute. Um, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while, Paul says. I want to tell you something. Paul had to write a letter to the Corinthian church because they had tore that place. I'm preaching redneck style right now. They had tore that place off. But they did. They tore that church all to pieces. They tore the church all to pieces. You had adultery. You had people squawking and walking around like, you know, thinking a lot more of themselves than they should have. You had all these major problems in the Corinthian church. So Paul writes them 1 Corinthians, and he tells them to repent. He tells them to repent. But he writes 2 Corinthians, and he says, I'm sorry this letter was so tough on you, but you needed it. You needed it. You needed the Robitussin, right? You needed it. And so he writes that letter. Now he's writing 2 Corinthians to comfort them after, after this difficult moment of their need of repentance. So what is comfort? I, I want to look with you that just for a moment to describe this God of all comfort. I want to look to the first slide where we have comfort and, and encouragement. If you guys could go down a few. Comfort and encouragement. So the word literally means, there's a few definitions of this word comfort. Uh, one of the meanings is that of encouragement. You see, Barnabas is called the son of encouragement. Same Greek word used to describe Barnabas. By the way, if you're going to do a character study, every time you see Barnabas in the New Testament, guess what he's doing? He's comforting people. He's encouraging people. They called him the son of consolation. Everywhere he went, he was somebody that lifted people up and didn't tear people down. Probably should take note of that sometime, right? I'm, I need to think about that a little more, do you? Um, everywhere Barnabas is, he's always trying to lift people up and bring, and they called him the son of encouragement. This word comfort means encouragement. Next slide. This word comfort means a call to support and to be beside. Now, that word also is the word that Jesus uses to describe the Holy Spirit. He's our comforter. You see that there in John 14 and John 15, John 16. He's called our comforter. And that word means to come along beside. It says the Holy Spirit will send a comforter. Uh, let's just take a break for a minute. A little commercial for Jesus. Um, you ever wonder, Jesus left us? Are we here all alone until finally we get home and we'll high five Jesus, but I, I'm not going to see him between now and then? That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Jesus said, I will send another comforter in, in my name and in my place. Did you know Jesus is as much with you now as he was with the apostles? You say, wait a minute, that's not true. Is that true? Jesus said it was. Watch this. He says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, another comfort, and he is going to walk beside you. He's going to be beside you. He's going to come alongside you. He's going to indwell you, and he's going to walk beside you as your helper, your comfort. You know, most of our church is one of the, the missing ingredients. Um, I made some biscuits one time, and they were terrible. I made them in California. I don't know if it was California's fault or my fault, but <laughs> they were terrible. And I said, I needed some buttermilk biscuits or something because I went to this restaurant, and they said they had country biscuits and stuff. Uh, what was the name of it? I, we won't say the name of that restaurant. <coughs> And I went in, it was supposed to be biscuits and gravy, and I get in there, and I ordered the biscuits and gravy. It was not biscuits and gravy, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> not close. I'm eating them, and thinking we're a long ways from home. <laughs> so I tried to replicate the buttermilk biscuits. I got in there, it took me several weeks, several bad batches. Hard biscuits, soft biscuits biscuits you could launch into outer space. They wouldn't even come apart, you know? I heard a snort on that laugh. I heard it. But, but what was wrong with my biscuits is I was missing an ingredient, you know? You miss an ingredient in those biscuits. They're just, I mean, 
too much fat, not enough fat, not enough butter, too much buttermilk. You know how it works. Cooked too long, not long enough. I was cooking a pork loin yesterday. I won't tell you where I got it from, but y'all can imagine. Um, we were, and I was out there watching that thing. I left it alone, just like the teacher told me. He said, don't look at it. Just leave it alone for that amount of time. But I wanted to look at it often, so we left it alone. One of the missing ingredients in our churches is the Holy Spirit. And it's not that he doesn't indwell Christians. It's almost like we've apologized for him, though. You know? Let's keep, let's keep this Holy Spirit in order. Let's make sure. Let's, let's make sure the Holy Spirit goes by the book of order. We talked about that this morning. Let's keep him chained up. Make sure he doesn't leap his bounds, you know? Don't chain, don't, don't, don't put a governor, you know, those race cars having a governor on, don't put one on the Holy Spirit, okay? Don't put one, you let him take care of who he is, and, and you listen. That's our job is to listen to him, not to control him. He's God, right? He's God. We don't control him, we listen to him. We bow our knees to him. We don't manage him, he manages us. We, we worship him. God is called the God of all comfort in this passage. And part of that comfort is this coming along beside of us. And he's provided every tool in the toolbox you need to thrive as a Christian. If we only quit apologizing for him and quit hiding Jesus. Quit hiding Jesus. What are you going to do with Jesus on Christmas morning, by the way? Or at Christmas lunch? When all the families there and half of them are Christians and the other half are not. Are we going to hide Jesus in the back room of the house and hope to God that nobody brings up his name because we don't want to offend anybody? Are we going to hide Jesus wherever we go this Christmas season? I, I, I don't know what you're going to do with him, but man, he hadn't hidden his love for you, my friend. He certainly didn't hide his love for you. I, I, are you with me this morning? He didn't hide his love for you. This is something to celebrate. Let it turn it loose. Talk about him. Talk about him. I know there's a lot of sleepy saints just dragging their feet through the world. You know, you know that. Just sleepy and down and negative all the time. But God has bought you back from the damned, my friend. He has bought you back from a hell, a burning hell. He has bought you back. I'm excited about that. Are you? He bought you back. Don't kid yourself. Don't plan him out of a service. He has bought you back. He has bought you back. When you step into your house, your house has been bought back by the King of Kings. This is something to celebrate. This is something to celebrate. Now, listen. He says to us, he says to us that he is this God of all comfort. Another definition of comfort. He says to us, he says, is calling to one's aid. That's another definition. And I think about that. Um, Lisa's pretty good whenever I get sick. I don't know how your wife is. You may, you know, there's man sick and then there's woman sick. When us men get sick, we're really sick. You know? <laughs> right? We can't hardly make it. So sick. So sick. I've got the flu. It's the worst flu. It's the worst. My, my temperature's got to be 103. Right? COVID, COVID really did put a number on a lot of us, but mine was the worst, you know. Is, yours like, is your man like that? It's terrible, honey, help me. The teenage boys aren't much better, but I'm not going to preach on them, okay, whatever. But God is this God that comes along to our side and comes to our aid, and he comes along to help us. He comes alongside to help us. I still hear some bickering about these men. Just let it go. Let it go. Let them go. Just let, give them a pass, okay? <laughs> Finally, though, just, I'm just giving you the definition of this word comfort. We're just taking a time out. We won't be here much longer. So let's just worship for a minute. Is that okay? He says, uh, the, the last definition, one of my favorites, and, and John really used that. Let's go to our next slide. It has legal overtones. So, when Jesus calls the Holy Spirit, by the way, he calls him this advocate. You have an advocate with the Father. Uh, Jesus is called an advocate, and so is John. So we got a lot of lawyer work going for us here. We got the Holy Spirit, 
making arguments for us and looking out for us and standing up for us. You got Jesus who's called an advocate. We got this God who is our advocate. He's a God of comfort. What does, what does somebody do when they advocate for you? What do they do when they make, they make this argument for you and they stand in, in your, on, by your side on your behalf and they say, no, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is my client and I'm, I'm defending this client. This is the way that word was used in the ancient culture. They said, hey, this is, this is our person. I'm going to make an argument on behalf of this person. I'm going to stand up for this person. I'm going to stand up for this person. And so... When it says, this, one of the uses is a legal use of the word, our God, our God is this God of all comfort. So let's put it in context now. We talked about that we pulled the word comfort aside. Let's put it back into the text for a minute now. Let's look at it. Paul said, we've been suffering. We've been suffering. Now he's suffering for the gospel's sake. I don't know why you're suffering, but either way, the principle applies. We've been suffering, Paul says. But these, this God of all comfort has been by our side. And he's been our advocate. And he's been watching out for us. And so I just wanted to, to take that time out for a minute and look at the God of all comfort. He's done some work for you. I don't, you know, that's the interesting part. You know, you, you, you may have an item in your house that, that was handcrafted. I don't know. Some of you ladies probably do. You didn't see it as it was handcrafted, though. And maybe if you could have seen the work that went into it, you'd like it even more, right? You'd love it even more. And this piece of comfort, God has handcrafted. He has been working on it for you. He's been at work on your behalf. And he's shown you great love and this comfort that he's provided for us, this God of all comfort. Um, another thing it says... Uh, uh, another thing we're looking at, I got my numbers mixed up on this, uh, but anyhow, we'll keep trucking here. He, he's a savior of comfort. In verse 5, um, we see that Paul says, as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. And so Paul is saying that I'm not just suffering for no reason. It's because they're missionaries and they're getting the gospel out there and they're suffering for it. And it's a difficult moment for them as well. But in Christ, they share in comfort. Christ has not left them alone. And he's promised not to leave us alone. We learned from the Great Commission. Here's where I want to transition for a moment and just talk about what kind of stuff are you sharing. Because let's look at this heartfelt apostle in, in our, our next slide. It says, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings. Paul says this, I comfort people because God has comforted me. I comfort people because God has comforted me. Watch how this works. You know, at the end of this service, you may have a heavy burden, and you can't quite let go of it. And you may need to let go of it and give it to Christ and realize it's been paid for. That doesn't mean you don't have to still walk around it. It doesn't mean it's not near you anymore. It just means it's paid for and it will be destroyed if it's not destroyed today. It will be destroyed one day coming soon. It might be your bad health. It might be a terrible situation you're in. Maybe something you've done wrong. And you can't forgive yourself for it. But God is this God of all comfort. Now, when Paul begins to talk about comforting, he gives us this gospel ministry. He talks about it later as the ministry of reconciliation. But he gives us this gospel ministry. And this, I hope, animates you today. Because some of us are experts at pouring poison wherever we go. Okay? What that is, is us... You know, there's real victims in the world, but there's those of us that like to victimize ourselves. Truth? And we pour poison wherever we go. Everywhere we go, we're pouring poison out. And where God has called people that are in a place of suffering, what you will find to the person who is suffering 
and seeking God. You may have a beautiful spirit in this congregation here this morning that's like this. You, somebody may come to mind. But when you get near them, you might find that they have been through a lot of suffering. And for some strange reason, even though that you have been through a lot of suffering in this room, one of you, two of you, I don't know who you are, you, when you get around somebody like that and they've been following Christ, you find out that grace comes from that person instead of poison. Because God has been their comforter. And when you get near somebody that God has comforted, you begin to be comforted as well. Amen? And that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of grace that Christianity produces, okay? You know, you can't leave sin alone and it leave you alone. Did you know that? You, you say, well, don't bother them, they won't bother us. It don't work that way. Have you ever noticed that? It don't work that way in politics. It don't work that way in any shape, form, and life. You leave it alone, it leaves you alone. It don't work like that. But I'm going to tell you something. Grace, grace ha will one-up anything, that kind of poison every time. If you're spewing poison everywhere you go, you need to repent, my friend. You need to repent. Come back to the foot of the cross and say to yourself, God, maybe you need to give me a new mind and a new heart, and I need your grace and I need your comfort. Because God, my friend, God, my friend, is looking for Christians in this room right here that will encourage the person sitting next to you, not tear them all to pieces, okay? Now, I don't have any one of you in mind. I'm looking at you. No, I'm not. I don't know who you are, but somebody needed to hear that. I needed to hear it. I know that. Your home will be that much better for it. Hey, God can heal your home. Yeah? He can do it. He's good for it. You might be out of money and you're out of time, but he's not. He can do it. He can do it. He's the God of all comfort. I want to close with a little story, and then we're going to worship with communion. So um, I'll just say her first name, Jessica. We, we had a good friend um, up on the mountain, we'll call it, up on the mountain. And um, she's probably, I don't know how much younger she is, but she's, she's in her early 30s, I would think. And um, a little over a year ago, um, she woke up in the middle of the night. She was pregnant. She has two boys. She woke up in the middle of the night, and she knew she had lost her baby. She didn't know how she knew. She just knew it. And she panicked. And they went to the doctor. And uh, sure enough, she did. And so... They get it there, and they're at Winston, and she's a nurse. And there was this procedure that they wanted to do to remove the baby. But as they did, it was a procedure that they used for abortion as well. And for her personally, that was a, that was a very difficult situation for her. And she, she struggled greatly. I talked to her on the phone that, that day, and it was in the middle of COVID. They weren't letting anybody up there, and or they still weren't letting anybody in that environment anyway. And so she was, she was very upset, struggling greatly from loss and a combination of all those factors at the same moment. Then they were going to take the baby. I wish I remember her name right now, the baby's name. But they were going to take her, and they said, hey, we'll, we'll dispose of, of the child or whatever. And something clicked in Jessica at that moment. And she said, you're not going to throw my baby in the trash. You know? And it hurt her so deeply. Because that was her baby. And that's, there were just ways of disposing of the child. And it... it it struck her deep. And a few months later, um, she called me. We went to her house. She called me on the phone. And she said, "I want to have a funeral." She she asked for the ba the body, and so she got the body of that little baby. And uh, man, it's hard telling you about it, but she got the body of that little baby. She got a casket and put her little baby in that casket. She said, "Can we do a funeral?" on a Sunday afternoon, I think it was, after church, um, 
many of us at church, we showed up, you know, my friend Adam and a few others, they did special music out on the edge of a field, I guess it was a family graveyard, I can't remember, and, uh, and their testimony was that their baby was a person too. They weren't making political statements, she was making a personal statement. There wasn't any cameras there, there wasn't any politicians there, and so she was there to make a statement that God gave her this baby and she was going to give this baby back to God and that this God, this, this God that she has um, had stood by her through this situation. We preached that funeral a, as a child that was made in the image of God and we worshipped on the edge of that hillside and we preached and we worshipped and we all came together that day. Fast forward, just a few weeks ago, she gave this testimony of how she went through that process, and many of you maybe have been through something like that in this room right now. I'm sure you have. But she used what she suffered with to preach to others about a year later. Now, she teaches at the high school, and that morning that she gave that testimony and preached about and taught, I don't know, that she probably did preach, and talked about it, um, every child in her nursing class was in that service. Tons of kids that had never heard the gospel. And she was able, because of the God that we worship, she was able to take something she suffered and to take the comfort that God gave her and to comfort others with the same comfort that God comforted her with. God is able to take your brokenness and turn it into something, my friend. I don't know what he's going to turn it into, but you can comfort somebody else with what you're suffering, my friend. You can do that. Because God is the God of all comfort. Let's pray. Jesus, before we um, worship in communion, and before we um, close out in singing, we ask your healing in this congregation. And it's by your stripes we are healed. It's by your cross that we are healed. And it's by your sacrifice and your substitution that we've been bought back. So, Lord, we ask and we pray that uh, we'd have tender hearts, repentant hearts. Lord, help us to, help us to encourage others. It may be at work. Maybe we're, we're the person at work that needs to help. Maybe we need the help, whatever the case may be, at home. Heal us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, so I'm going to call our elders up that are uh, serving our elements this morning. And um, I want to say this. This is a moment at the end of the service of worship. This is a moment where we can look again at the cross. And I'm going to ask um, our, our folks operating the cameras. We, we love you guys that are watching online, but we are going to turn the cameras off for a minute. So... Um, we will have this time of worship and, and make it a little more personal if you